this is this is this is We are in Herrera world. We are. We are. <laughs> Welcome back, man. We're Have Herrerafied. We are Herrerafied. <laughs> Wait, we've got the name for your for your next solo album. There you go. We we are Herrerafied. Well, dude, I wanted. I, I saw you had had a solo record you just put out, and it's. Introducing Ralph Champagne. Who is Ralph Champagne? But I just wanted to talk to you because I was like, I put the, put on the record and I was like, oh my God, this is so good. And what? it's exactly what, I was not surprised at all, at all. So uh, for those listening, it's classic country. Like, is that a good, fair <laughs> representation? Wow, classic country. <laughs> <laughs> it's classic. Uh, and, and it's got the... the Black folks would feel about that. It's got black <laughs> charm. It's 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 got the black charm, but it is it's it sounds <laughs> like classic country. Yeah, I mean, we really we really managed to make a great retro sounding record. You know, it's got those great kind of Americana sounds to it. And yeah, you know, about half the record really has a very sort of outlaw country or country rockabilly or whatever kind of feel to it. And then there's stuff like just like some novelty humor songs and some kind of you know a one kind of mellow torchy song and one kind of weird 70s pop duet thing you know it's it it kind of goes through the same way like the new dwarves records kind of hit every hard genre mm -hmm. it's like the ralph champagne record kind of hits all the softer you know americana genres you know that that's sort of what i'm trying to do anyway i love it is so but, ralph champagne's your alter ego yeah, Ralph Champagne's another new alter ego. And, and of course, I, I got to credit Josh Freeze because I stole the name from him 100%. I mean, that was a pseudonym that he used on a Dwarves record. And I, I just thought it was so funny. And then when it came time to do, you know, it was weird, too. Like, this this record is almost like it's still, it's still, you know, kind of showing me what it is. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, when we went to make that video for Lolita Goodbye, and I put on the outfit, you know, a friend of mine, like, designed this Hugh Hefner outfit for me, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, I kind of started to realize who this character was, like, it was almost like an, more like an acting job than music this time, yeah. you know, it was like, wow, this guy acts this way, this is, you know, it was a weird kind of uh, thing, you know, because the Blag character, I'm very sort of used to playing to the point where it's sort of you know, it, it, it's kind of like the real me. And then it's kind of this ridiculous version of, of me. Mm -hmm. And then I guess Ralph Champagne is kind of the same thing, you know, <laughs> kind of half baked Hugh Hefner guy. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Yeah. 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 It's got the, it's got the Andy Kaufman kind of vibe where you're not sure if you're serious or if you're joking, but you know, it's for, it's for you to, it's for whoever's seen you to decide, right? Like it's kind of, well, and the music is no joke. I mean, the music, I think, stands for itself. You know, that was sort of one of the big right. things, you know, that it wasn't, you know, you know how it is, Mike, right? The guy, the, the old guy from the punk band goes to do his country record. <laughs> All it is is it's the same shit with an acoustic guitar, and then he hired some guy to do pedal steel all over it. And then it's like, yeah. hey, I'm country now, you know, it's like this, this record was a lot more like, kind of a retro pop record that really had you know every song was very carefully kind of crafted you know so yeah man a really thrilling uh thrilling feeling right now to have have this record out and really feel like wow you know i made something totally new mm -hmm. in my mid 50s you know mm -hmm. that was like not just a bite of what i'd already done you know i mean that's that's kind of the most fun part of it you know i think i think it is you know you you're just talking about how you didn't phoned it in you really planned out these songs and the productions like that's something that people you know like somebody like you that's been in the business for your whole life and you're still pushing the quality you know and that i think and and i would say as well like your your latest dwarves record uh take back the night great quality like whoa so the fact that you're doing that is what catches people like me you know like when i'm i'm not paying attention to really anything right like but then i see your solo record ralph champagne and i'm like 
Oh my god. Okay. So I love it. Congratulations, dude. Oh, thank you, man. Yeah, you know, yeah, that that's kind of the trick, isn't it? Like and and it's weird. I think sometimes you know, everything evens out in the end, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, when I was in my 20s, I, I don't know what it was like for you. But every dad I'd wake up in my 20s and another one of my friends would be a fucking millionaire with a major label record deal. And I'd be <laughs> sitting there going, oh, blah, 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 blah. like, do, do I get anything ever here? You know, and it was like, well, you know, you said fuck or you you showed some tits. So I guess no, you know, I guess you don't get anything, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and like it, it just kind of kept me hungry, you mm-hmm. know, and and it, it kept me like wanting to make great shit and prove myself, whether it was making Dwarves records with most of what I did or making, you know, different kinds of records like Ralph Champagne or trying to write a book or, or, or whatever. It was always about, hey, man, people don't get it yet. Like this shit is great. <laughs> you know, you got to mm-hmm. check this out, you know, and, and that, so I think that kind of kept me hungry, whereas a lot of the guys I knew who got those record deals in their twenties, you know, it sort of wound it up one of two ways, you know, if they're kind of happy and well adjusted then they just are repeating themselves and doing the same easy shit now that they always did and just counting the money and selling the t-shirts and kind of kicking back. And they haven't done anything interesting in a really long time or more often. It was like people really took a nosedive after the, that major label deal ended. And it was like, oh, my God, you know, there isn't somebody here to to tell me when to wash my socks and what I should do. And there there isn't anybody, like, being my handler and showing me how to rock. You know, what do I do? And these people just kind of fall apart and get more and more fucked up on their drugs or whatever they're doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it is, it's, it's like, I feel like for me. I kept fighting to try and make some good art, you know, and when, if you're not fighting, then you, you're kind of, you slow down and you make some bullshit, you know? Yeah. You know, it's very important to like, sort of realize that not everybody's going to, going to push as hard as, as you, or it, for me, it's inspiration. It's like, that's what I'm trying to do. Um, always. And the, and the hardest part is, is what you're saying is people don't know what to do. They don't know. They wake up in the morning and they're like, I guess I could write a song or I could maybe go play a show. And that's literally all they know how to do, you know, a lot of artists. And today you just, I mean, you can't get by like that. Even if you're, even if you're on a major label or have management, you still like today, it's just not flying. You have to get out there and make decisions, work on projects. And I, and I know a lot of, a lot of artists probably work on things that don't actually help them. You know, that could be a problem too, right. you know, but, but it's like, if you, if you really are into something, then build that infrastructure around it, you know? So if it's, you know, a new album that you're working on or whatever, it feels like you started building that infrastructure with Ralph Champagne a little bit. So do you have a band or was it studio musicians coming in? How did that, how did that get together? Yeah, because- there really wasn't a band, but I did have a partner, this guy, Andy Carpenter, who I think is a really great producer. You know, I used to work with Eric Valentine and he was sort of my, mm-hmm. my guy for a long time. And, and I, I really came to rely on a person like that. Who's got, you know, perfect pitch and plays every instrument and does all this stuff, you know, yeah. like, or like a modern track maker guy than a, than a, the old fashioned band thing that mm-hmm. we came up with, you know? And so Andy really helped me in the first stages. And it was funny. I mean, I must've had a premonition because January, 2020, before the pandemic, I went into the studio with like 25 songs and I said, okay, here's a bunch of songs from over the last like 25 years of songwriting for me. None of this stuff fits with the doors. Like, what do I do with this? And so we just methodically went through them all played the songs down on an acoustic guitar and just said, what key should this be in and what tempo should it be at? And once we completed that, then it was a question of figuring out, okay, how do we overdub on this? Where do we overdub on this? What are we going to do? And then the pandemic hits. Mm. So it was like, it was kind of cool in the sense that I wasn't able to do what I just always would have done, which is like, well, let's get the band together. Let's play this music. Instead, it was, okay, I'm just going to sing this whole record because that's all we got. It's just you and me in this room. Nobody else is leaving their house. You know, what What? What are we going to do? Mm-hmm. And, and so I sang the whole record over the acoustic guitar. 
And then we just got rid of that acoustic guitar and said, let's start from scratch. Here's the vocals. They're done. Now let's put drums on this. And so you go to Josh Freeze's house and you start putting drums on. And then it starts to sound like a, like a record. You know, then it's like, okay, well, let's put some bass and some acoustic guitar on here. I brought in my friend Tom Ayers, who's a great player uh, from a band called Persephone's Bees, kind of a weird international pop kind of group that a lot, a lot of people aren't familiar with, but they played up here in Oakland a, a, a lot. And so Tom came in and played bass, acoustic guitar, and electric guitar. And by the time that was over, it was like the cake had been baked. You know, I was already really happy with the vocals. And then the rhythm section they put on, it was great. So then, you know, you entered into the weird, <laughs> you know, we're in the middle of the pandemic. If you want violin on a song, you can't do a session. So you got to like correspond and people are sending you things on on email and you're just like that whole part was the most difficult part trying to get these cool like country overdubs and things with guys I didn't really know mm -hmm. and you're not there in real time you can't sit there and go hey man can you make it a little more like this or a little more like that they're just sending me stuff and I have to email back and you know what I mean so yeah that part was 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 strange but the whole thing of starting from the vocal instead of from the track was a revelation you know that was like a whole new thing for me so yeah that's insane i've never I've never done that once in my life to be honest yeah, and me either wow like it was the pandemic that forced it and i would never go back for this kind of music i mean for mm -hmm. doors like, different you know you really need that band vibe and it's i'm, I'm just kind of singing based off this aggressive rhythm section but on this stuff yeah it was just like here's the vocal let's go you know? yeah Click and vocal, huh? Click, 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 click. <laughs> well, no. I, I put my terrible acoustic guitar playing over the click. Good. And I sang over my terrible acoustic guitar playing. And then as soon as I could, I got rid of my terrible acoustic guitar playing. And that, that was the end of it. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Me on guitar is not a pretty sight. Yeah, but you write on guitar, right? Yes. Mainly guitar. Do you write on any other instruments? Uh, I, I'll write with loops. You know, like with okay. dwarf things, I'll, I'll like, uh, one thing that I do that I think is kind of unique that people didn't really pick up on with the dwarves is that, um, I'll do it like a hip hop guy does. And just the way they'll grab a loop from an old Isaac Hayes jam or a James Brown thing, I'll, I'll grab a loop from some obscure sixties punk band, hmm. loop that, and then make a song from it. I've done that a dozen times and nobody ever seems to pick up on it. Cause then you go, you start piling overdubs on it. Mm -hmm. You can't really hear the sample anymore per se. And then people don't really understand that it's a punk song or a garage song, but it was made in a hip hop way. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of an interesting thing too. Um, but you know, man, nobody's set up to ask you those questions or talk about that. You know, it's always just like, who'd you beat up, you know, or what kind <laughs> of drugs did you do or who did it, <laughs> what happened? You know, I, I'm glad to talk about it. You know, that, yeah. that stuff's fun, but there is some music here, you know? Yeah. You yeah. Want to check it out. You guys just have such a hard image. You know, you look at your records, you look at your artwork, your posters, and it's like, but then you're black. You're a nice guy. You're you, you're an <laughs> artist. You're a great songwriter. You you think uh, you, it's like I could see how there's that dichotomy, you know, where people just want one thing, but it's like no, you to get this, you ha you need this too. You need both. Yeah, well, I really appreciate that. I mean, I always say, you know, there's gold in the middle of the road, right? <laughs> the simpler you are, the easier you are to explain. You know, here's yeah. Bruce Springsteen. Is your working class hero? Here's a song he wrote it on his acoustic guitar. Here's his crack bar band, you know, here we go, you know, then four hours later, the show's over, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, I don't know, man, I, I admire people like that. I respect people like that. It's just never what I was trying to do. You know, I always kind of saw myself as, as an artist more as like, a, than like a workman of music, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm not, yeah, you know, but there were a lot of times when people like didn't quite get what was happening because, because of the image stuff. But what can you say? You know, we cultivated that image and it's my own fault that it's out there, you know, because we part of it was true. <laughs> We'd get thrown out of every venue or get in a fight or shit would happen, you know. And then after a while, it just swallowed itself up. You know, it didn't matter what was true anymore. It was just, oh, that's funny. Yeah, sure. We did that, too. You know, and after a while, you've, 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 you know, you're you're 
it's a three ring circus of kookiness you know yeah have you guys done any documentaries i should i haven't done my homework on this this aspect but like <laughs> in case you have i mean i'd love to know about it but and if you haven't maybe yeah maybe that's i mean in the there cards. should be there should be one of those but again you know to me it's all art mike so yeah. when i look at other people's biography i'll see biographies of bands that are much more famous than us and then you'll see these real obvious problems i mean one is that half the movie is like an old person sitting in a chair going, I saw Ian McKay when there was only five people in the audience, you know, and you're like, <laughs> okay, man, you know, it's all, it's always like stroking the ego of whatever artist is, is they're doing it on. And they don't, I mean, every now and again, somebody will, you know, bring out all the worst things, you know, but it's like, right. it's, it's hard to find the honest, like, well, there's good and bad for really literally everybody out there. So let's be and honest. It's just and, a fun movie. I mean, I yeah. want to watch a fun movie. I've seen some of these, like Scorsese's movie about the Stones, I found to be very interesting because it, was, it, it wasn't it was like Tom Hanks's Beatles documentary where it's like, here's what happened to the Beatles here. And then you get some great footage and you're like, cool, it's the Beatles. With, with that Rolling Stones thing, it was people talking and then archival footage. And the people talking were saying interesting things, you know. So what I always thought of for a dwarf thing would be like just telling stories. Mm -hmm. Just just it, it, dwarf stories are the funnest part, whether they're true or not true. Yeah. So it's just get a bunch of people to tell stories and show archive footage and do shit. It was like my only rule. Like I hope there's a dwarves documentary or film or book and soon, you know, at some point. But my only wish for it is that it not be one of those talking head things that suck. Yeah. You know? You know what would be cool is because there's probably a lot of stories where there's no archival footage, maybe you get some archival footage and then you mix in uh, illustration. So you can yeah. do some really sick stuff with illustrations. Exactly. I mean, there's so many fun ways you can go with these things and kind of tell an oral history of rock and roll and have it be fun and have the documentary itself also be part of the fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's just there's a lot of people who just aren't terribly creative in the documentary world. And they just they just shoot talking head shit. And that's that's 90 percent of the documentaries I see. And it's like, OK, it's one thing if we're talking about, you know, the movement of arms from Sudan or something. And it's like, OK, I understand why you made this this way. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about rock and roll. We're trying to have some fun with it. You know? yeah. I don't really want to see what, you know, Ian McKay's mom felt when she was giving them cookies and you know at the discord house but it doesn't i don't care you know like it's it's more like let's let's make some let's continue to make this all fun and art and interesting and let's yeah. evolve you know and the, i think like with the solo album shit you know for most people that's just devolving it's just going well i used to play rock and roll and do it kind of aggressively and have fun but now i'm mellow and old so i just am kind of mellowed out and it's like well fuck i don't want to hear that yeah. Well, that's want, the thing is if it's good, it's good. Yeah. Mellow, hard, fast, whatever. It's like, sure. I think there's seasons for everything. So I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to be the one that's, that's going to complain about that because I've done it myself. You know, I, I like, I love playing <laughs> acoustic. I love going slow, but it really gets me amped to like get back in the saddle playing punk rock, you know, yeah, get yeah. my bass going. And, and so I don't know. I feel like, I think they that each hand washes the other, you know. Sure. Yeah, and if you're making a great record, I mean, there's you know, there's those great mellow records that we all ha have, you know, have treasure, mm -hmm. you know. Um, uh, Elliot I Smith. Do you ever get into Elliot Smith? He's great. I I'm not. I don't really have any of his stuff, but I remember hearing it and thinking, oh, this is interesting. But I didn't even hear it until he had died. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I was definitely a little little late bloomer. I saw him. Uh, randomly in Australia, we were walking by and he was playing in this bar and the door was open and we're like, and someone's wow. like, that's Elliot Smith from the US. We're like, who? Okay. You know, but like that was sort of like a cool introduction to him. But um, yeah, just somebody, you know, I, I got into that, but I my music sounds nothing like him, you know, so right. it's it was sort of like, okay, you can be, you can be a fan of somebody and not necessarily play what they play yeah absolutely and you know you got to go go in the lane you're going in i mean if what you're feeling is mellow then yeah make that mellow record you know but it's just i i just like it when people evolve as opposed to devolve you know mm -hmm. 
And a lot of musicians are just lazy, so they're always in the process of devolving. <laughs> you know, they 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 hit their peak when they're twenty, and then everything is just now, 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 now. You know. Yeah. So I'd like to think I'm hitting some of my peaks now. That'd be good. Absolutely. I I honestly I think a lot of it's mindset too. Is like, if you feel washed up, if you feel tired, if you feel old, then you're gonna act and look and and be old, tired, and and washed up. But on the other hand, you know, you're putting out classic country records and, and, uh, you know, the 2018 dwarves record you just released was insane. You know, it was great. Um, sounded great. Songs were great. I mean, and it didn't seem mellow, you know, it was like the same dwarves just, yeah, new, just well, new. Yeah. It's even cooler than that. We, we went into the studio in February and recorded 25 songs in two days. With a version of the Dwarves that was like, you know, Josh Freeze on drums, Nick Oliveri on bass, you know, Fresh Prince of Darkness on guitar. Um, there's our new drummer, Snoop Pock, who, who plays great kind of speed metal stuff. <laughs> so we had all these, uh, you know, we, we, we managed to do so many songs so quick. And it was crazy because there were some people there. I had somebody uh, taking photos and different people doing different things. And everybody made the same comment, like, I've never been to a session like this. Like I've never been to a session where every half an hour we have a new master take yeah. all day for two days straight. Just like boom, 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 boom. It was like, and it was like old school rock and roll. Like, fuck, we're killing this. Like half of the, half of the drum, half of the keeper drum parts had keeper bass on them too. Just like bonus. It's there. Yes. You know what I mean? Like it was like a bunch of guys playing live and you really get that feeling of like an old rock and roll band knocking it out live. Now, of course, you know, once the initial recording was done, then I go in and just finger fuck it beyond recognition, you know, forever. But, you know, at least the basis of it is like, it's a punk record. It's a rock and roll. We went in and knocked these songs out and just did it. And so, you know, I think you're going to get the same vibe from the next Dwarfs record. It's going to be a double album. This is the first time we've ever done that. Because we just have so much material. Wow. When's that coming? Um, I think that's going to be the end of 2023. Oh, I should okay. have mixed by the end of this year. And so then, you know, but you got to wait so long for vinyl now. It yeah. takes a year for, for, for something to come out. But uh, so, yeah, I mean, the Dwarves thing kind of continued. I got this Ralph Champagne solo thing. But and the, the other thing I did during the pandemic was I wrote a new book you know, which is called Highland Falls. And that is yeah. coming out through this press called Rare Bird in, in, in LA. So again, you know, it's just kind of another way of communicating, another way of trying to do something interesting and another way of kind of tweaking people because the, the main, I write fiction, you know? So again, most guys in rock band, they come out with their book. It's like, this is what it was like this day. Or, mm -hmm. This is when I met Dylan. Or, this is when we finally hit the charts or whatever. It's like, I didn't, I didn't write any of that. I just wrote, you know, fiction. And the main character is like a teenage girl. So it's just another way of sort of being transgressive and coming at it from a different angle and di representing something different and doing, you know, it, it it's, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's sort of been an avalanche of creativity and, you know, over the pandemic, you know, and then I kind of hit the wall. <laughs> and then yeah. it was like, oh, shit, wait, I'm as fucked up as everybody else, you know. But for the first year, year and a half, I really tried to be productive and do shit because I, I could see everybody else falling apart because I couldn't go to their job, you know. Yeah. It's like, well, OK, I, I better keep working here. I'm going to lose my mind, you know. Yeah, I, I I mean, I kind of feel like the same thing. Like I worked, we did live streams through the pandemic, but then like once it was sort of like everybody was kind of getting back to sort of nor not normal, but you know what I mean, uh, early this year, kind of 2022, I feel like it's been so hard to get things going again, you know, and, and whatever it is. But um, I wanted to ask you about the book, you know, a little bit more. So it's a novel, it's like a yeah, it's, it's fiction, and uh, it's a follow-up to my last book, which was called Nina. That came out in, like, 2007, 2008, somewhere in there. And, you know, just the story of this very transgressive, like, oversexed teenage girl. Um, and so, you know, 
I wrote this follow-up novel. It's a little more three-dimensional than Nina was as Highland Falls. It's got a little more character development and a little more, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, it's still got the black elements that you'd imagine, right? There's a lot of <laughs> sex and a lot of violence and a lot of just insults and humor, you know, kind of shit. Yeah. But, um, you know, to me, it's the kind of thing, the best use of it would be if somebody made a, like a Quentin Tarantino fun movie out of it, you know, cause it's yeah. a lot of sex and violence. It's a lot of fun. I think, you know, it's, it's, uh, what's, what's that like versus like songwriting, you know, because I'm sure everybody can imagine what it might be like to write a book. You know, you, you sit down to your computer or, I mean, I guess not, you, you type things, right? Like, is that how yeah. you're doing it? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, how, I mean, how often are you writing when you start, like, I'm going to write a book. Do you do it every day, like for a couple hours in the morning? Like what's, I want to get into some actuals on like how you actually do this. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question, you know, because there's always this vibe when you're making art of any kind. And it's sort of like that, you know, we know that 90% of people are just lazy as fuck. Right. So the first rules are always like, you know, if you're a writer, sit your ass in the chair, write your thing. Or if you're a musician, get out there and start playing, you know. And it's like you have to overcome the inertia and actually do something. There's a lot of fairly talented people, too, but they never get started. It's all about like, I could write a better book than that. I'm just never going to start it. Yeah. You know, or I, I could do a better song than that. I'm just never going to start it. Cause of course your, your fantasy book or your fantasy song are always better than everything else. You know, it's right. actually doing it. That's difficult. Right. It's that resistance. But, right. Yeah. So it's like overcoming that for me though, I then completely reject the work ethic thing after that point, as long as I'm working, mm. I'm done with it. So you hear a lot of writers and they say, God damn it. I sit in that chair eight hours a day. I don't care. You know, and I, or I write 50 pages a day, every day. I don't care. You know, they get, I'm just like, what's that? The triumph of quantity over quality. I don't care how many pages you wrote. I care if one of them is good. You know, I don't, I don't care how many songs you came up with. I care if one of them is good, you know, it's yeah. like, so, so once it gets to that point, like I don't force myself to write in other words, and I don't really write from a, an outline. So I just go by the seat of my pants and start writing. And what occurs to me is what I put down after I have the bulk of the book. Then it's all just rewriting, rewriting, rewriting. And then other things will occur to me or I'll go back and make plot points work that didn't work. You know, but I, I very much just let myself go when I'm writing. I don't force myself into a an outline. I let it go where it's going. And I feel like that's like the rock and roll of it. Yeah. That's the, that's the fun part of it, right? Yeah. Then the editing is the production part of it. Right. Yeah. And when I make a record. I kind of need both. It has to, like I was saying with the door, it has to start from rock and roll. We were together. We were in the same room. We rocked out. And then you start finger fucking it. And then it's all the, the production. Right. So with the book, I'm kind of the same way. I go in to have fun. Mm-hmm. I write things and I laugh while I do it. <laughs> this is funny. You know, I like this. Yeah. You know? And and if I get enough of that, you know, that, that then there's a book there. Then I start, uh, um, you know, honing it. Yeah. Wait, let me, let me let my cat out. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, the same way I, I basically write songs like that. I don't have an outline and I just kind of let my thoughts occur, you know, like, and so I'll come up with a line and then go from there. Boom, 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 boom. And sometimes it works. I don't know if you heard any of what I just said, but I was basically no, I just did, saying yeah, you're saying you'll lay out a line or something and see if it works. Yeah, and then just go from there like it's just like I'll I'll write until I can't think of anything and then I'll I'll set it down and and go about my day and come back to it. And that's yeah. kind of how you you do you're doing it in a way where you realize yeah. that it's a whole it's holistic. You know, you might come up with one thing one day and then it takes three months to figure out, Oh, this is what I should do with that. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think people put a big enough premium too on actually listening to the music they're making while they're making it. Mm. The thing that tortured me about my early days in music was that, you know, some half-ass label would say, we'll give you a thousand dollars, you know, and you go great. You know, it's like, okay, you got 10 hours now make your record, you know? And it was like, okay, you know, now, once it's rolling, I just sit there and listen to it. Mm-hmm. 
You know, it's like, oh, shit, what does this need? And then I, I'll figure out, oh, it needed a French horn, you know, two months later, you know. Yeah. It's like, just listen to this shit and see if there's something you can add to it to make it interesting. I hear people's punk records and it's like, God damn, man, like this is half baked. Like you <laughs> you wrote a half baked song. Then you went in with guitar based drums. You did it and you got your half baked record. And nobody thought about this. Nobody cared about this. Nobody, nobody fucking loved this thing. Which is why when I hear that record, I don't love it. I'm like, fuck this record. You know, this is another person's generic shit. They just had to do something. Right. You know, they had to they had to do something. So here it is. You know, it's like I don't want to hear your fucking something. That's the human experience. Had to do something. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. And that is why it's so hard. I mean, when you find a punk record that's like, oh, that's really good, you don't necessarily know why it's so good, but it's because everything, a lot of what we hear is just half baked, like you're saying. And and it's been like that for a long time. When when uh, around the mid 2000s, maybe it was a little earlier than that, when all these producers and mixers were and still are kind of, but have gotten better at it, putting drum samples on everything, right? And everything sounded fake, fake, fake. A and things do still sound fake, but I think we're a little more used to it, right? But <laughs> And it's right. gotten better. But but yeah, I just remember hearing the, a lot of those records and just going like, this is absolutely horrendous. And I hope this doesn't last too long. And it was probably like what happened back in the 80s when, when you know, the... Um, Maybe it was the early 90s when the, the loudness wars were happening with mastering records and everybody was trying to get their record louder. And then you'd have all these mixers and mastering engineers being like, oh, you know, these guys, it's they don't know what they're talking about. You know, it's not about loud. It's about this and that. And I just always found that to be hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. My, my, my entry in the loudness wars was the dwarves must die. I'll still <laughs> challenge anyone to find a louder album than that. If you put on the CD of that record, I guarantee you it's louder than everything in your collection. And and what I compared it to while we were doing it was Snoop Dogg's record, which was the loudest record ever at that time. Yeah. You know I mean? Yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put that on so after. It was so fucking loud. It was so brilliantly mastered. And so, uh, I mean, the way you get a loud record is by having a good mix, too. So there's something mm -hmm. to be said... <laughs> It's like an opera when they say, you know, loud is good. You know, it's like, but I, I know exactly what you're saying, man. And I think you, you and me kind of lived through a couple phases of punk. You know, one of them was really when, you know, when, when I got into punk rock, which was a good 10 years after it started, you know, or whatever. I mean, I think I, I started playing shows 1983 or something. Mm -hmm. It was very kind of sixties garage oriented and really, you know, when I started making anything approaching a hardcore record, it was maybe the mid eighties, 80, 87, 88, something like that. And, you know, it was like punk was still not yet a genre. It was a way of doing things. Mm -hmm. It was a way of, of doing things. I mean, when you compare the early punk bands, they're all different. You know, what do the talking heads and Blondie and the Ramones really have in common when you listen to their record? But mm -hmm. it was all just a way of doing things or a way of playing in a particular neighborhood or a particular bar, in their case, CBGBs, you know, whatever it was. So it was like you and me kind of lived through that period when, you know, Nirvana first and then, you know, really kicked into shape with Green Day and the offspring. And people said, OK, this is a real genre. You can really make a hit record here. So here's the formula and let's go. Yeah. And yeah. everybody just followed this kind of Green Day-ish formula. And you really were hearing just like, wow, this is just a genre now. It's not a way of doing things. It's like, this is what punk sounds like. Like, just go try and sing like like Fat Mike or, or Billy Joe. And, and then, you know, I'll always have the same beat. Do -de -do -de -do -de -do -de -de, you know, and always go at the same tempo. It's a little faster than 120 beats a minute. It's not disco. It's like 130 beats a minute. Okay. So, yeah, this is a little more punk, you know, whatever the fuck it was. Yeah. Like, it was like you could just hear the formula. You yeah, know, no, that, you're right. that I think was a big change. And we haven't ever recovered from that. And I don't think we ever will in punk rock. I mean, just it becoming a genre. The people who profited wildly off it were the people who were in the center of that storm. So whether it was, you know, Offspring, Green Day, Rancid, and other bands that are quite good and definitive, mm -hmm. but they really profited wildly off that. The fact that it was like, okay, this is where 
punk is now frozen in amber. Like if you want to be a punk band, you better look like Rancid and sound like Green Day and whatever. You know, like yeah. that that was sort of what happened then. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about like Black Flag getting into when Henry Rollins wrote Get in the Van and all, you know, re reading those books, putting them on, I think we had them on CD and we put it on in the van when we were in our van touring, you know, and it was kind of like, okay, this is, you know, just make, <laughs> I don't know if we're making, we're not making sure, we were just like, we were into the culture of punk rock and so like we wanted to know what our favorite punk bands were doing, you know, when they were touring. 10 years, 15 years before us. We started in 1992, so 10 years after you, or yeah, about 10 years after you. And, um, but I mean, for us, like the first punk band I ever knew was, was, well, Henry Rollins and Descendants, like separately, um, through my cousins, you know, and, and Suicidal Tendencies I actually knew about them, but they were more like thrash metal kind of vibe, even though they were kind of in the punk scene. Um, so yeah, it's I'm trying to think of like how did like did I just did I get did I get genre you know as far as yeah, like punk I mean, I rock think you're younger than me and so you probably did yeah I I I was 14 when I saw Decline of Western Civilization at the movie theater and that was my first introduction to hardcore and prior to that I had seen some stuff on Saturday Night Live things like Devo or 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 you know the B52s or whatever yeah. I think I saw Sid Vicious in Mr. Mike's Mondo video. He did Sings My Way or things like that. Like, yeah. I picked up from pop culture some things. But basically, like, it was seeing decline. And, and you know, all of a sudden, it, we it was starting to come into shape what your uniform was supposed to be, what shit was supposed to look like. But there was still enough variety then that you really got that sense of, like, mm -hmm. you know. And so my angle was, like, well, I love – you know, I I had uh, I used to hitchhike to high school, which nobody did, I guess, in Illinois. But <laughs> I, I'd grown up some in Westchester. I was born in Illinois, moved to Westchester as a kid, which is in New York, and and we used to hitchhike a lot. Mm. And then when I moved to Illinois, I stuck out my thumb first day of school, and this guy picked me up like, you know, nobody hitchhikes here in Illinois, man. You, but I'll just pick you up, you know, it's fine. And I was like, okay, you know. <laughs> and this guy played me the Velvet Underground, the Nuggets compilations with the Seeds and the Chocolate Watch Band, the 13th Floor Elevators. So it was a 14-year-old, and and then he took me to see uh, a Decline of Western Civilization, mm -hmm. as well as playing me like the Eddie Cochran record, the Gene Vincent record. So. I sort of got this crazy education of 60s garage, 80s hardcore, and and 50s rockabilly all in the same like month. Yeah, and it really it really synthesized everything for me, and it made it very like it was hard for me to just pick a genre at that point because I'm like fuck man I love this 50s rock and roll this is the real shit but that's like the oldies mm -hmm. I love these young guys with Black Flag they're going for it this is great but I love these 60s guys they had kind of a cool style and everybody had the same outfit and blah blah so for me it was like fuck I, I couldn't I kind of couldn't decide what to be yeah whereas I think for a lot of people in punk it was like you know I'm from California. I went out and there was a thousand good looking kids that all had mohawks and we all knew that what we were supposed to be was no effects. So there you go, you know, and it was like, well, shit, that, that isn't how I came into it. Mm -hmm. I didn't come in with the uniform and the, and it's funny cause the, the, the California guys all know me. They're all bigger than me, but they all respect me. You know, when I, when, when, you know, I don't know how much they like my music. I don't think my, I don't think the doors were a big influence on those, on those kind of guys, um, those kind of second generation fat Mike, Billy Joe, all these different kinds of groups. But you know, what, what, what I found was that, um, you know, the, the form of punk they made was really good and you could latch onto it. The form of punk I made was really good, but you couldn't really latch onto it. It was very like, why are these, why is there one guy who's naked and has a mask on and then another guy with a tennis uniform? And why is there like, these guys don't look the same. They don't sound the same. How come that first record had a bunch of sixties organ on it? And, and then he's dressed up like Elvis. And then the next one was like, you know, like nothing really yeah. made sense, you know? So it's like, I, I've very much resisted the whole genre thing, but it's been very successful for a lot of people that I, that I know. Yeah. And I think they respect me, but they don't, they still don't really get what I was trying to do, you know? Yeah. I mean, I got into punk, like 
I guess like Rancid was just coming out with their first album. I was already into punk. I, I was going to this local band down the street from my house and they were called Bad Juju and they sounded kind of like Bad Religion, but I didn't know who Bad Religion was, you know, because I was literally, I was in, I wasn't even in junior high yet, I don't think. Mm -hmm. So, or maybe I was in junior high, but, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, just thinking, thinking back to like the early days of punk and it was, it was not the same. You're saying ex exactly right. Each band sounded like them. So like when I started listening to like Social Distortion, um, that was kind of my my um, decline of Western civilization movie, you know, uh, another state of mind with Social Distortion. It was like them right. touring with... Uh, uh, yeah. What is it? Youth Brigade. Youth Brigade, yes, yes, yes. And they're in the back of the truck and like... Mike Ness is like on the side of the road with his guitar writing another state of mind. It was like, that's me. That's what I'm going to do. You know, like, right. I think that yeah. sort of inspired me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, you know, then when I got into punk, it was funny because, you know, when I started playing live a lot, because things don't happen overnight. Like we played at Gilman Street the first month it was open. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we played at Gilman Street the first month that it opened with the digits which was a great band from Illinois. And, you know, it took a while for Gilman to sort of become what it was over the uniform to kind of be what it was. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, yeah, it's, it's always these, it, these things kind of happen over time. And then when people inherit them, they just kind of take it for granted. You know, I was like, this is great. There's an all ages place. And, and, you know, the kids can go see shows again, just, just like I got to see shows when I was a kid. This is great. Meanwhile, everybody in my band is like, they're all a bunch of pussies over there and you can't drink beer. And this all sucks. And the, you know, the, the chicks are ugly and they've all got, you know, uh, just boring outfits on. Let's just hang out at the clubs in San Francisco. There's chicks here and we can play and we can do it, you know? And yeah. I was like, but, you know, it's all ages, man. You got to bring this music to the kids, you know. Meanwhile, <laughs> you know, <laughs> nobody really knew that I was the one behind the scenes in my band really advocating for 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 Gilman Street. Because as soon as we'd get to Gilman Street, everybody was mad at, at me from that place. I'd punch somebody or somebody saw me <laughs> snorting a line of coke or something happened. And it was just like, hey, man, fuck you guys. You know, we don't we, we eventually it was like, we, we don't want you guys here. You know, yeah. it was like, well, but fuck. I'm one of you, uh, you know, Green Day. I love that. That's great. You know, I was like, no, nah, you ain't one of us. You know, it was very <laughs> like we, we were always kind of getting chased out for some shit that we did. And I'm not saying it's not our fault. Right. You know, we would do shit that would infuriate people. But, you know, we we came into rock and roll, in other words, and there wasn't really a formula right. for it. There wasn't an underground formula yet for how you get big and what you do. A band like the Butthole Surfers is very different both in the music they make and the stage show they have than a band like green day i mean it's just night and day but both of those things could could you know jockey for position you know because they they were it was just underground bands doing what they want to do mm -hmm. and then eventually it kind of solidified and gelled into this like no this is what punk bands do and all of a sudden you know if you sounded like no effects part 12 you could get on his label and then make your mediocre ass you know, no effects knockoff record and still probably sell five times what the dwarves record that we did that year sold, you know, <laughs> I mean, so it was just like, okay, you know, like it was, uh, people could jump on that bandwagon, you know? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We were in the studio in LA, uh, for ever passing moment and Crosby stills and Nash were in there as well, mixing something. And wow. that's what they said about us. Like we were no effects, like the no effects <laughs> knockoff band. And he was kind of <laughs> like those, you know, those crappy chords they're playing over there are going to like sell more records than our, our complex harmonies is what he said. It was, wow. it was, it was, uh, what's the big guy Crosby? Is that? Crosby? Yeah. Yeah. David, David Crosby. Crosby. <laughs> You know, it, it's funny how this shit works because those guys know more than you think. Like you see somebody <laughs> think, oh, it's just some old square. And it's like <clears throat> he did every drug imaginable, fucked every group he could, played in the birds. Yeah. He helped to invent folk rock. I mean, you know, those guys were just out there in the clubs looking for chicks, trying to have some fun. Oh, yeah, and then, I'm sure. And then it evolves into this like, you know, lugubrious Crosby, Stills and Nash <laughs> thing that, you know, is, is 
takes over Woodstock and it's all this shit. But you know that all of those guys were just like, Beatles, cool. Yeah. <laughs> pussy too. You know, that was the <laughs> three, four years before. That's what they were saying. Yeah. And for the record, we kind of just laughed about it. We're like, this is awesome that he's, he's <laughs> mad at us because <laughs> we were too loud. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. Good times. But anyway, I mean, <laughs> punk rock has, uh, I mean, it, it, I'm kind of feeling like, if anything, punk rock's kind of like a cockroach, you know, as things get corporate, as more and more clubs are owned by, you know, the biggest corporations, money's all from Saudi Arabia and all that, you know, there's still going to be little indie punk shows. And, and that's what really makes me, I don't know, uh, hopeful for the future of, of, of music and of, of the punk rock that I love. So, um, I want yeah, that next generation to keep going, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's true. And hopefully they will throw us away as being too old and out of touch to understand. <laughs> yeah, know? they probably already have. But, I mean, we, we still have our, our, you know, our people that, that love this kind of stuff. And until right. they all die, we will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm hoping the dwarves are always kind of looked at as a band for young people to find a way in because it's just so immature and so just obviously sexual and scatological and violent that the whole thing is just like, fuck, you know, once you get a little older, you just aren't interested in that anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, so it's for kids, you know, great. I mean, you know? Yeah. But, but also it's just for punk fans that love punk rock and love what you guys do. But, um, what about, I was, I was, I was about to, bring up your records because i thought that you guys were gonna like do some reissues coming up for the doors yeah, speaking of that do um, that before everybody's gone <laughs> yeah exactly so if you're an old school dwarves fan you've got a lot to be happy about um we reacquired all the sub pop albums so blood guts and pussy thank heaven and and sugar fix are all coming out and they've all got you know, remastered and with additional tracks. So songs that were seven inches and different things that came out around those records. So you get extra tracks, it's remastered and you get extra artwork, you know, the covers of the original seven inches or, or picture discs or different things. So we put a lot of love into these reissues and, and <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's, um, blood guts and pussy should be out, uh, the reissue, in November and then in December sugar fix and thank heaven for little girls. And then in January, um, come clean, which was a great sort of kind of the beginning of the modern dwarves at, 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 at epitaph where we did all the genre hopping and the drum processing and weird things. Um, and then a record called, the uh, uh, radio free dwarves, which is a lot of stuff we did on European radio and then a bunch of B sides. And so, you know, you're basically getting like this avalanche of reissues this year, which hopefully will get some, you know, people thinking about the dwarves again. And then next year when we make a real new record, they'll, they'll be, uh, you know, it'll sort of be solidified that this should be in the punk section. I mean, yeah. that's kind of my ambition for the moment. I try and keep my ambitions business wise, pretty reasonable. <clears throat> you know, it's always pissed me off that you go to the punk section and you get certain bands, you never get the dwarves. We're always just in D. And I'm like, look, man, you know, here's 12, 13 albums over a 40 year period. I mean, can you just give me a fucking section, please? Like, everybody should have these dwarves records. You know what yeah. I mean? And everybody should know that everybody should have these dwarves records, you know? And I think, you know, hopefully we'll get there. You know, that would be nice. You need a, an album called the, the Dwarves more than just the D. That's right. We're more than just the D section. <laughs> Don't throw me next to that one Divinals record for the billionth time, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, dude, I, I love, uh, you know, I've gotten some classic records recently, the Smoking Popes record. Um, you know, I love getting classic records from, you know, when I was discovering music. And, and those, you know, there's certain songs from, you know, you're, you're probably just not childhood, probably adulthood, but younger adulthood where you just probably listen to that thing over and over and over. Like that's, those are the kind of records I love. And, uh, I can't wait to see your stuff. So it's insane that everything takes so long to press. You must've been right. like 
ordered these last year or something. But. Yeah, exactly. These fucking things have been on order for a year. Uh, so, you know, you, it, <clears throat> yeah, the vinyl wait times now, everybody complains about it. It's just crazy. Got to let you know, I don't have much control over that, but yeah. No. That yeah. Ralph Champagne record is going to be in stores on the October 21st, and you can already go up and check it out on YouTube. You can see that very funny video we did for Lolita Goodbye. Got to check that out. It's, it's so funny, and you know, yeah. just um, I, I uh, yeah, this is a great little period. I'm I'm having a lot of fun. That's awesome. Yeah, everybody, look up Black Dahlia because it's on all the all the streaming sites, um, Apple, right. Spotify, all that. So if you want to stream it now, you can. But October 21, it'll be on vinyl. Officially out on vinyl. You can you can order everything on the Dwarves site. If you just go to the Dwarves dot com, you can. You can see where you can stream it and where you can buy it and whatever you can fucking any way that you can give me money. I think you should, <laughs> even if it's just sending me cash. Just feel free. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Right on. Um, anything else you wanna wanna get out there? I guess you know, just go. Everybody, go spend money on the dwarves. Yes. If I did any charity work or cared about anyone other than myself, I would. This would be the time to talk about it. But I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> no no man i mean it's a crazy life uh are you into any sports or do you hate sports are you <laughs> i don't of... hate sports i actually was like a young jock guy it's just when i started smoking weed around 12 13 the sports went out the window which is <laughs> yeah. kind of more is the pity you know because now i'm like older and fat and it, you know i i really love basketball a lot I still, you know, basketball's on. I'll still watch it, you know. But any sport, I was a Cubs fan, you know. Nice, I, yeah. I, I, uh, I actually don't hate sports the way people would think I would. I'm, <laughs> I'm pretty good at them, actually, surprisingly good. But um, right on. I, I, By where, the way, you are not fat, Black. I, I, <laughs> don't don't call yourself fat. You're you look great. You look I've rested. Dating, I've started dating a yoga instructor in the hopes that she can. Show me how to how to not be so fat anymore. Really? Okay. I you know what's funny is I haven't really ever done yoga like legit yoga at a place, you know. But people have constantly, not constantly, but over the years, said, you know, you should try yoga. And I feel like I'm starting, and I've been thinking about it the last couple weeks. Going, should I try yoga? And you know, I feel like you know, I still doing shows. I'm constantly stretching. So I'm like, well, why don't I? stretch constantly while doing yoga and strength and so i guess my question is is how much have you done it and uh, <laughs> what do you, you know, suggest you have to put your ego away especially as a guy who's pretty good at sports mm -hmm. i mean because i'm not good at yoga okay yeah and so okay. you have to look at it as i'm doing this so i can stretch a little more and be a little stronger and that's it i'm not doing this to be good at yoga but i look at my I look at my girl and she's just ridiculously good at it and does it for an hour and a half at a time and, you know, can just, you know, kiss her own ass but from behind and whatever. I mean, you could just do, turn any way and do anything. And I just look at that and I think that's health. Yeah. That's what health looks like. Being you know, able to move. Just that you're flexible and you can move. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, yeah, you know, it's it's uh, you got to keep up with your body, man. You can't just divorce yourself from it. You know, that's the thing you get away with when you're young. Mm -hmm. I would just get fucked up and never exercise and eat a pint of ice cream at, at, the, at midnight. And, you know, you get, you know, and then eventually you turn around, and you're like, oh, shit, it caught up with me. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> you know I, I, I'm definitely not anti sports because I think you need that shit. To keep from dying, you know. You just described everybody's life, just like yeah. eating ice cream and pizza and beer and just getting <laughs> fucked and then going, oh, shit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I bet <best> do something. <laughs> love it. Love it. Hey, man, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to be keep spinning this record, Ralph Champagne, for life. Let's yeah, do buddy. Thank you, Mike. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Black. Cheers, bud. Have a good one.